I, I'm really glad to be with you all, by the way. Um, I lived in Boston uh, many years ago in Cambridge and Somerville and Alston. And, um, uh, and, and we'll be back there in early September, actually doing a little talk in Cambridge. Um, and uh, also at one point in my uh, life considered becoming a public teacher and went into schools to observe. And I'm, I have to say, I am in awe of what you do. I just, I, I bow down to you. Um, so I, um, I am a scholar activist. Um, I've worked for the last 30 something years on issues of US military policy, particularly in Latin America and human rights issues. Um, worked on human rights accompaniment in Central America and in Colombia in order to protect um, the security, strengthen the security of human rights defenders. Um, and uh, now work both on this project as well as a project of um, demilitarizing policing in the Bay Area where, where I live. Um, so um, I like to um, uh, both get into the data, figure out where the money is coming from, where it's going, and also see who it's impacting and really um, uh, talk with people who are impacted. Um, so um, I welcome um, interruptions, or we can also do um, like lots of Q&A at the end. Um, so I'll just start with the, the most recent wave of um, uh, U.S. arms transfers to Mexico um, uh, begins uh, in 2007 when um, then President Felipe Calderón declared a drug war. Um, violence was increasing in Mexico as um, uh, drug, the drug trade was displaced, um, partly as a result of earlier U.S. military campaigns in, in Colombia or in, in, and then at that time as well. Um, that displaced the trade um, from the Caribbean, from the Andean countries into Central America and Mexico. And so <laughs> Mexico was a, principally a transit country um, for illegal narcotics, um, but then also became a production country uh, increasingly, not just for marijuana, but for heroin and, and methamphetamines. So um, the Media Initiative was uh, a joint um, and, and still exists a joint um, U.S.-Mexico program to combat um, uh, illegal drug trafficking and organized crime, primarily using police and military forces. Um, initially, it included um, assistance to Central America. Um, it's now, um, the, the aid to Mexico that has been part of the Media Initiative is now more than $3 billion. That's the aid part, not the, the arms transfers part. Uh, that is the sales. Um, that when people talk about the Merida Initiative um, as a as a policy or a program, um, it uh, is it now it's only Mexico. It does not include Central America, um, but it excludes assistance from the Department of Defense and from Homeland Security. Um, so it's a, it's a smaller package of assistance. Now, if we look, and, and most people when they talk about, <clears throat> and I think it's important in the context of debating arms sales. When people talk about U.S. military um, programs in Mexico or in other countries for that matter, they're usually talking about assistance. And um, that assistance, as you can see, it peaked. So this is a, is a graph from 2000 through 2016 of the amount of assistance from the U.S. to Mexico. The um, green part is uh, essentially what was the Merida Initiative. So that goes through the State Department. The blue part is what's going through the Pentagon. The blue and the, and the red here are um, Pentagon assistance programs. So as you can also see, they actually increase after this peak of assistance in 2009. Even though the overall assistance decreases, the percentage of it that's going through the Pentagon increases. It's mostly Pentagon assistance. And that assistance is not as transparent as what goes through the State Department as the Merida Initiative. Um, you, we usually don't know how much it is until after it's been given. Um, there's a lot of more we could say about that. Now, so that's just the assistance. Now, if we look then at a combined assistance and arms sales, again, this is military and police aid. This does not include non-military police aid. 
But if we combine the sales in the picture, the orange here is the arm sales. Um, and this is both uh, direct commercial sales as well as foreign military sales in the orange. Um, then we see that, um, in fact, the, the overall transfers has dramatically increased even though the assistance has gone down, which is really also important in the, in the Trump context because the overall approach of Trump has been give less, sell more. Like that's why the focus on Saudi Arabia because the Saudis pay in cash, right? So um, the, that you know, continues what was already happening before Trump came in, where in, in essence, um, the US assistance, military and police assistance in Mexico declines dramatically, but the sales increase, which means it's not as much a US taxpayer issue. It is more Mexico that is paying, um, which becomes important in the overall um, decision-making and geopolitics of it. So um, here's just something about, okay, so these are sales, whether we are talking about foreign military sales or whether we're talking about direct commercial sales. So foreign military sales are sales that are facilitated by the US government. They are a government to government sale. And um, there are certain benefits that the buyer gets out of that. Often there's training involved and other kinds of, there's pieces to the package um, because it comes with the US government and parameter. Um, um, but either way, it's private companies that are producing stuff that is then being sold uh, in a, either a direct commercial sale or for a military sale. So this is just from 2012 through 2016, a number of the major announced sales of, of arms to Mexico. And the one I want to point out here, which I'll come back to, is this larger one here, if you can see the cursor where it is, uh, with Sig Sauer. So that's actually the largest of all of these, and that is for firearms. Usually, the biggest ticket items in arms sales are aircraft right? So, or vehicles of some kind. So you can also see here, the next largest one was, um, these are Humvees that are produced by AM General in, um, in Indiana. Uh, Mexico bought several thousand of them. Um, so it's very unusual that firearms be such a large sale. And like I said, I will come back to that. My, my, my primary focus <clears throat> has been on firearms. So I don't, in terms of your case, I'm not sure exactly how much you know, you want to focus on the other arms, but we can talk about that too. Yeah, so, arms is definitely the central focus of the case. Okay, so um, something about the Leahy Law, I got a call yesterday from another um, debate person in Denver who was working on this, who asked about the Leahy Law. So um, the Leahy Law is a federal law um, instituted in 1997, which um, does, um, does, does not usually apply to arms sales. But it's important because it, um, it, it articulates a principle that is applied to military and police assistance, which is instead of like, if you have a human rights problem in a country, say it's the Philippines or Israel or Mexico, instead of cut it, cutting off aid to the, to the whole country, like saying, well, you know, let's throw the whole thing out and cut off aid. What the Leahy Law does is it, it focuses it in on the units that are responsible for documented human rights abuses and says it is prohibited for the U.S. to give any kind of assistance, not just police or military assistance, but any assistance to a foreign military or police unit if there is credible information, if the State Department has credible information, that members of the unit have committed a gross human rights abuse and they have not been brought to justice. So this um, is not always applied, but it is sometimes applied. Um, and we think it should be applied to sales as well. Now, technically, according to the Arms Export Control Act, it should apply to foreign military sales, but that is not the way it's interpreted by the State Department or, or even by, by Senator Leahy, usually. So, so. Um, okay, so Mexico in context, this is, a, um, with um, data from the Census Bureau. Um, in 2017, the same thing repeats in 2018. Mexico, you can see, is the, is the bar on the far left, is the amount of firearms and explosives exports by country. And you can see that Mexico is by far the largest buyer in Latin America. This is Latin America. 
there's some other countries in other regions that are also um, large buyers. Um, and um, so it's, it's a, a very important case within the, um, the whole uh, um, hemisphere. Okay, now this is a graph of, um, and I'm not sure if, uh, if this is blocking you here. Um, uh, we, we can see the whole thing. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so this is a graph of the types of firearms exports to Mexico. I'm sorry, uh, this is, sorry, this is to the world. Um, uh, from, I'm sorry, I should have done one to the one to Mexico. It would, it would look pretty similar to Mexico in terms of ratios. Um, from 2002 through 2018. And um, so the, um, the blue here is, um, is uh, this part here is um, ammunition. Um, this part, the orange part is um, parts. And then the red here is military rifles. So um, these include, military rifles include uh, machine guns, they include um, assault rifles, semi-automatic uh, rifles, um, as well as some other uh, weapons, uh, sniper rifles. Uh, I think, yeah, they don't include mortars, mortar firers. Um, and then these are um, our handguns here, and then and, and some other arms. So um, now, when we look at what, um, so in Mexico, um, according to Mexican law, the Mexican army is the sole acquirer of any firearms from the exterior, right? So they, if you're a, if you're a seller in the United States, you cannot sell to a private buyer within Mexico or to any entity besides the Mexican army. Um, which is known by its initials as Sedena. Um, and Sedena, the army, is also the only distributor of firearms within Mexico, legally, for legal, legal transfers of firearms. Um, so most of those, uh, as you'll see in a second, are going to police, but they also go to private parties, um, as well as other federal agencies. So, and this is just a, a graph of um, the number of firearms um, that were um, distributed by the army um, to um, uh, different, both state police and private parties um, for a 10-year period. Now, this is then uh, a graph of who, who received weapons in Mexico in general uh, for, from the data we have. So this is not just what the army is transferring, but also what the army is producing so increasingly, the army has been producing its own, um, for, it, for its own use, um, it's been producing its, its own rifles, um, although it imports, you can see it does still imports a fair number. And then the army then transfers, the, the largest portion is to state and municipal police, the green here. And the federal agencies and private companies are grouped in the data. But that, so that would include like uh, private security companies. It would also include um, the equivalent of the FBI um, uh, and other, other public agencies that, that carry firearms. Then um, the sales to the public is about one in six. Um, so these are private individuals who are buying. Um, and so there's only one gun shop, legal gun shop in all of Mexico. It's run by the army. It's located in Mexico City. You have to produce uh, lots of different uh, documentation in order to obtain a firearm. Um, and um, there's 10 to 15,000 that are sold a year approximately. Um, and then the Navy um, also acquires firearms for its own use. So that's kind of the exception to acquisition from the exterior. Um, and the Navy has acquired a lot from Sig Sauer. So that sale earlier that I showed you was primarily to, um, uh, from Sig Sauer was to the Navy. Okay, so now, um, the United States is not the only supplier 
for um, uh, long guns and other military weapons that are transferred to Mexico. So this is a graph showing the regional origin of firearms transferred to Mexico over a seven year period. Um, and you can see that national production has gone up during this time. So that's th those are the firearms that the army is producing for itself, for its own use. Um, the red is the United States. Sorry, I didn't have this, this in English. This, these are names of regions. Um, the pink is the, the kits, um, which are parts of Sig Sauer weapons that um, were being assembled by the Navy for its own use. The um, brown is, um, these are Beretta weapons. Um, so we know Beretta is a large supplier of firearms to Mexico. Um, and it, Beretta is, um, has weapons that are produced both in Italy and in the United States. And then um, the, the green is from Europe and the, the blue is from, from Israel. So Israel is a significant supplier. And you can also see that this does vary um, year by year. Okay, now let me talk a little bit about this um, Six Sauer thing because you're in Boston. Six Sauer is just located an hour away in Newington, New Hampshire, um, on the old um, Pease Air Force Base. And um, so they are increasingly a major, worldwide, Six Sauer is becoming a, a major supplier, particularly of handguns, although they also produce military rifles. Um, uh, in fact, in 2017, the number of handguns exported globally um, practically doubled, primarily because of exports by Sig Sauer of pistols. Now, so Sig Sauer gets a license from the State Department in order to sell firearms. That's how um, gun exports work. Um, that license is good for up to a certain amount, and it's good for a certain amount of time, and a license can have in it restrictions, <clears throat> and it is typically for certain kinds of firearms. So, um, and these licenses are generally, um, we can't see them <laughs> in the public, um, but we got a, a portion of it through a Mexican uh, document request. And um, so this particular license was issued in 2015 and it is for up to $265 million worth of guns and parts for semi-automatic pistols and submachine guns. That's an enormous, enormous amount of firearms. Like that would supply the entire um, police force in Mexico uh, permanently, basically. Um, so it makes you wonder, and the Navy is, is you know, has like 50,000 troops and only about a fifth of which actually deploy. So it makes you wonder, what is this for? And we know that um, through census records that only a portion of this has actually been sold. The license is good until 2024. Um, and these are parts that uh, Mexico is then assembling for use. Um, so um, now a little bit about where some have, have been going mostly prior to this license. So a lot of six hour guns are being sold to police. And this is just a, a graph of, of all the different states. So Mexico has 32 different states, 19 of them have received six hour firearms. And I wanna point out that this includes Michoacan, which is one of the most conflictive states in Mexico. Um, uh, lots of human rights abuses, lots of collusion between police and organized crime. Same thing in Tamaulipas, which is on the border with the Rio Grande Valley of Texas, and where there are more illegal firearms confiscated than any other state in the country of Mexico by far, um, and where the military and police are widely perceived to be colluding with organized crime. Um, it's the home of the, of the Setas and so on. So um, the question becomes, how did the State Department uh, execute this license, did it allow, did, did it have any restriction on the states that it was going to? Or was there a restriction and there was no follow-up? There was no end-use control on where the firearms were going. 
Either way, it's problematic. If the State Department licensed these weapons to go to police in any state in Mexico, the State Department would readily concede that that's a problem. If there was a restriction on where they went and there's no end use controls, then there's a problem in, in, in how those end use controls are working. Um, so we can talk more about that. Uh, the Mexican Navy um, has been equipped with, um, with these uh, assault rifles, military rifles. Um, this is a picture of Naval Special Forces uh, on an exercise last summer um, in California where they were using these rifles. Um, um, and there's a uh, particular set of cases um, in Nuevo Laredo, which is right, it's right over the border. It's right, right on the border with Laredo, Texas. In the first half of 2018, when over a three month period, more than 50 people were forcibly disappeared, primarily by naval forces. Um, and that case is, is pending. So this is one of them. And um, uh, so this is, um, this is actually, um, footage of a uh, naval operation in which two men, um, the, the, these troops, they came into the home of Jessica Molina um, in Nuevo Laredo. Uh, her husband and a man who was staying with them um, were taken by the Navy troops uh, during this raid. Um, they apparently were looking for someone else, but they took them anyway. And Jessica who has a U.S. passport, was, was basically only survived because they saw her U.S. passport. And the commander of the operation said, okay, leave her alone. But she has been now very vocal about the disappearance of her husband, who was um, a mechanic. Uh, they, lived on, they, had, they had lived on both sides of the border. Um, and um, she has gotten no answers at all. Um, and so that case in particular is, 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 if some of you have heard of the Ayotzinapa case, which I'll mention in just a moment, um, that's probably one of the most prominent cases in, in Mexico. So I should hurry ahead here. So um, we have data, and I would encourage you to go to our website, which is stopusarmstomexico.org. Um, uh, we have data on where weapons trans sales to Mexico are, are coming from, firearm sales. Um, by state, um, as well as by, uh, by company, um, some of them by company. Um, and so this is just, uh, 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 we have an interactive map online that can, you, know, you can see um, how much went from, from where. And actually, let me just, um, I'm going to um, just, uh, let's see here. I want to... Um, okay. Uh, well, I'll, I'll come back to that, sorry. Um, so um, there are also, um, there's a company in, in Arizona that produces grenade launchers that are used by Army Special Forces that have also been implicated in forced disappearances in Northern Mexico. Um, uh, that that company is called Milcor USA, um, originally from South Africa, now a U.S. company. Um, there, there are other companies. So the Yotsinapa case, which you may have heard of and your students may have heard of, um, was the disappearance in, five years ago of 43 student teachers um, in Iguala, Guerrero, um, by um, Iguala police forces uh, working jointly with federal police and army forces. Um, and the Iguala police had um, in their inventory, they, they were carrying that night um, AR-15s that were produced by Colt Industries. So Colt is um, based in Hartford. Um, they are a major supplier of legal weapons being transferred to Mexico. They're also a major supplier of firearms that are recovered um, at crime scenes in Mexico. Um, and so again, this raises the question of how Iguala police, which had, have a license from, from Sedena, from the army, to get weapons, but how these weapons were licensed, whether there was any restriction on where they were going or not. Um, there are also 
um, uh, cases of firearms that were used from the air. So some operations, um, counter drug operations, for example, and, and this one, this was in also in, this was in 2015 in Michoacan, in which a Black Hawk hel helicopter coming from the U.S. Uh, operated by federal police fired on a um, uh, a compound where there were uh, thought to be organized criminal groups training and um, uh, killed uh, about a dozen people extraditionally, uh, including five um, who were killed from a helicopter firing down on, on those individuals. And that firearm was produced in Arizona. It's uh, called a Dilanero. It fires about 3,000 rounds a minute. So like if you've ever heard a recording of a Las Vegas shooting, it goes ta -ta 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 -ta, or, or like a recording of what happened in El Paso. You hear a ta -ta 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 -ta, right? And this is more like thunder, just like continuous, huge sound um, and enormously powerful um, and has been used by uh, Mexican forces. Now, I just want to make a mention of, of the, uh, how this impacts migration. So um, about 70% of firearms recovered at crime scenes in Mexico were, uh, were, came from the United States, at least 70%. In, in Central America, Honduras, El Salvador, Guatemala, it's between 40 and 50%. But then US, uh, sorry, the government forces, police and, and military, are also armed by the United States. So the, the situations of violence in, in the Northern Triangle countries there is poverty, sure, but the combination of, of poverty with violence that is just, there's, there's no way out, is driving so many of these families to leave, including many of the families of your students, I'm sure. So they come into Mexico, and in Mexico, um, it's not just under Trump. Since 2014, Mexico has been pressured by the United States to keep migrants coming from Central America from arriving at the U.S. border. So under what was something called uh, Plan Frontera Sur, the Southern Border Plan, the U.S. was training and equipping Mexican forces to detect, detain, and deport migrants coming into Southern Mexico. So one thing that meant was that migrants began to take other routes. They would they would go on roads in, in buses or in, in the backs of trucks instead of going um, on foot or on, on the train where they were more exposed and were more likely to be detained and deported. But those other routes are more controlled by organized crime. And organized crime is primarily armed by the United States. So this whole idea of Mexico being a safe third country is absurd on its face because also, people get to the U.S. border, right? They're, if, if they get over the border and they apply for asylum, and then they are brought back to, to northern Mexico to await the processing of their asylum claims, they're in cities like Matamoros and Ciudad Juarez and, and Tijuana that have the highest murder rates in Mexico. So this, for example, on the right, shows um, homicide clusters uh, in a period last year. And you can see that Juarez and uh, this is Tamaulipas in here, um, and then uh, Tijuana have extremely high uh, murder rates. So it's, um, it, it's not a viable option to say, oh, well, either go back to Central America, right? Ha make Guatemala a safe third country or make Mexico a safe country. They're not, they're not safe in addition to all the other reasons why um, people should be received, that's, I think, a really important one to point out. So I'm just going to say a word about illegal weapons, and then I'll say something about policy um, alternatives, and then I think we have to close, right? So um, because legal purchases of weapons in Mexico are highly restricted, it's sort of like the difference between, um, so I live in California, where um, gun laws are much stricter than they are in Nevada, right? So the guy who shot up the garlic festival in Gilroy, he got his weapon in Nevada. He got, he got an autom a semi-automatic weapon in Nevada because they're prohibited here. Well, the same kind of market dynamic 
black market dynamic works between the U.S. and Mexico, in part also because while it's it's super easy to obtain military grade assault weapons in Texas or Arizona or New Mexico or other U.S. states, and then it's also very easy to get them over the border into Mexico. Why? Because the infrastructure, the the militarization of the border is all about the south to north traffic. Because after all, it's Mexico that has all those rapists and, and, and murderers, right? That's what we have to protect from. So the north to south border, in, in, in accordance with that narrative of the United States being the good guys and Mexico being so dangerous, is easy to get over. That means you can walk over the, the footbridge from El Paso de Juarez and bring stuff in a duffel bag and it's not a problem. Um, so that's, you know, and that Mexico has a, you know, has a role to play there. And one of the responses to the El Paso, even before the El Paso um, massacre, Mexico had announced and was bringing into its bilateral agenda with the United States control of the illegal arms trade going from U.S. to Mexico. I know you're focused on more of the legal trade, but I also know that it comes up with, because people say, well, if you're going to control the legal trade, what happens to the illegal trade? And that is a big issue. And the U.S. plays has a very important role to play there as well as Mexico does. So yeah. this is just um, more data on where the weapons are coming from. Texas is <clears throat> the largest supplier um, of, of illegal weapons going into Mexico by far. Um, and so that's why, you know, the fact that this white supremacist came from Dallas and that occurred in El Paso also very important in that respect. Um, John, just uh, on that point, um, that, that is going to be very central to the debate that we're asking students to have, um, okay. because the, the overarching topic it requires the affirmative to defend a policy about uh, restricting arms sales um, from the United States, so legal arms sales, legal arms sales and restricting those. But we do want the, a major part of the negative argument going against that policy will be the um, other ways that guns are getting into Mexico. And so the impact of um, only reducing legal sales without addressing um, other ways that guns are getting into Mexico. Okay. So let me just say a word about that. Um, we work on the questions of illegal trafficking. I don't think that... Um, I, I think that both are important. It's not, it's not like one should only do one. Um, if you only focus on the illegal trafficking and you continue to uh, arm uh, police and military that are colluding with organized crime, right? That's, that's one of the key pieces here is that the government forces that are receiving these weapons um, are not only committing gross human rights abuses in a system that does not prosecute human rights abusers, but those same forces are colluding with organized crime across the country and, it, it, uh, you know, vertically, you know, from high levels to lower levels. And that perception is not disputed by anyone in Mexico. Um, so that means that we are essentially arming legally forces that are um, in business with organized crime. And um, so while the, the flow of illegal weapons is super important, the United States has a very, very important role to play. I think that an assault weapons ban is one of the most important, if not the most important measures. Um, uh, in addition to end use controls. Now, one thing I would say about the legal sales is that if you reduce, if you, um, I, I know the, the positive case here is reducing levels to their pre Medida initiative levels, which is about a quarter of the current rate. Um, and if you, one way of doing that is to apply end use controls in a in a concerted way. So that means you, the, when the State Department receives and reviews existing um, gun export licenses, 
that those licenses have restrictions on them um, that prohibit and also follow up on um, distribution of those weapons to police forces that are implicated in organized crime or human rights abuses. Um, that would cut a, a very large amount of those firearms transfers because those it's essentially applying the Leahy law to arms sales. Um, and, you know, so it's not about saying, okay, we're just going to take one quarter arbitrarily of the existing sales and say, okay, we're going to allow the six hour sale and, but we're going to not allow the cult sale or vice versa. Um, it's about a, a applying those sales in a way that keeps the weapons from getting to bad actors. And that would um, de facto reduce the amount of transfers um, uh, in order to, I mean, it, it's also, the Lake Law is not intended as a demilitarization measure. It's intended as a measure to incentivize justice systems, right? We're gonna reward those units that actually punish human rights abusers and deny assistance to those units that are uh, allowing human rights abusers to be armed with impunity. The same can be applied to armed sales to incentivize um, better uh, processes within the justice system. Uh, because that is, that's a key part of it, right? Is that the impunity within Mexico is very high. Um, the, uh, the other thing I would say about um, the, um, the legal sales versus the illegal sales is that there is a kind of arms race, right? So the, the, um, the cartels and criminal organizations are able to get high powered military weapons through the illegal market because of the US retail market. Um, and so police then increase their weaponry and in response, organized crime arms itself better. Right, and so there, there becomes a you know the, the the power of the weaponry and the the pervasiveness of the weaponry becomes all the more, um, and the legal sales contribute to that. The other thing I would say is that the the overall strategy, you know, that that the um, reduction of arms sales should be part of a change in overall strategy, because the overall strategy of going after organized crime has been with military and police forces has been so disastrous. The homicide rate is at record levels. And the, a lot of the analyses are that when you use military and police forces to go after criminal organizations, you splinter them. Unless you have an effective justice system or unless you have economic alternatives for the people who are joining criminal organizations, um, unless you have protection for people who are journalists and human rights defenders who are documenting these issues, then you're, the, the, um, the organized criminal groups have no, they just keep going. Um, so um, the, the splintering is, is in many ways caused by the, the strategy that is simply arming police and military forces and using those to go after those organizations in addition to the issue of collusion, which I talked about. So I think those are some of the counter arguments to the negative argument that, um, uh, you know, legal sales, you, know, you need legal sales in order to go after organized crime who are getting their weapons from the illegal market. So let me just say a couple other things and then I, I need to go. Um, so um, this is a map of uh, feminicides in Mexico um, uh, over a three year period. Um, this is the different colors just represent different years of the three years. Um, and uh, this, it's not a large portion of the overall homicide rate, but it is going up and it is, it is part of what's going on. Uh, not all of the homicides and, and gun violence in Mexico is part of organized crime. Some of it is because of the pervasiveness of firearms, just like in U S states that have, um, uh, looser gun laws that you have um, deeper problems of gun violence the same thing is happening as more firearms come into Mexico 
um, and this is again mostly from the illegal market, you have also people who just and, and the justice system not working, they resolve any kind of conflict or um, or exercise power by by using guns. So in that you know in the existing relationship between men and women and patri patriarchy, that's that's so you're going to have more violence against women, and that's reflected here. Okay, um, I'm going to skip to the end. Um, say something about assault weapons. So there is increasing momentum for an assault weapons ban in the United States, a new assault weapons ban. Um, assault weapons are used um, in a very small portion of uh, violent crimes within the United States. The vast, vast amount of uh, portion of gun homicides in the U.S. are committed with handguns. And um, so, but they're very prominent and they have generated enormous amounts of fear. In Mexico, the, the, the assault weapon is used by criminal organizations that want to control territory. When they control territory, they make more money, right? That's, that's the way it works, that you control territory, you control illegal um, drug trafficking, human trafficking, um, extortion, all kinds of things, uh, you know, siphoning off of oil pipelines. Um, so to control territory, you want military assets. So that's basically trained guys and military weaponry. And so assault weapons ha play a very different role in Mexico than they do in the United States and a very, much more prominent role. So they're used in many, many, many more crimes and not just homicides, but, but also all, you know, rapes and extortion and forced disappearance and so on. Um, so if, and most of these assault weapons are coming from the United States, from the U.S. retail market. So an assault weapons ban in the United States would have a big impact in Mexico, and it is increasingly supported both by the population as well as by the Democratic Party. You know, most of the Democratic presidential candidates support it, but they're not addressing the legal arms tips, the candidate. Okay, so um, I just want to say one other thing about policy recommendations. Um, there is a proposal that, this, that the Trump, Depart uh, Trump administration has made to transfer firearms export licensing and oversight from the State Department to the Commerce Department. Now, this is not just a change of who uh, processes the export licenses. It's also a change of the laws under which those licenses are, are, are conducted. So, um, the State Department is required by, by the Arms Export Control Act to do certain things that the Commerce Department would not be. So for example, these licenses would no longer have any congressional notification. Right now, a, a, a gun export license of a million dollars or more must be um, noticed to, the, to Congress. That would no longer be the case. So we wouldn't even know about them. Congress wouldn't know about them. We wouldn't know about them. Uh, and there's a lot of other issues around, basically they're doing it because they want to sell more, right? Um, and the, so the end use controls would be even worse. There is now a bill, there's, a, there's an amendment to the National Defense Authorization Act that passed the House of Representatives that would prohibit this transfer from state to commerce. And that, the, the Senate version of the, of the NDAA did not have that. And so uh, National Defense Authorization Act. So that goes to conference committee in September. That will be resolved in some way. Um, we also need better transparency on the end users, as I was noting before. And that is an administrative issue that, um, that neither the Obama administration nor the Trump administration has attended to, but is allowing weapons to go to really bad actors um, within Mexico and in other places. And our, um, we're saying, until those things are addressed, the licenses should be suspended because until they're addressed, these weapons are going to, to bad actors. They're, they're going to violators of human rights and colluders with organized crime. And then in terms of the, you know, the illegal trafficking, there's a number of things. There's the assault weapons ban, and then there's um, uh, um, enforcement that could occur much better in border states, U.S. border states. Um, so um, I just want to mention one other thing. You're in Boston this evening. There is a vigil 
uh, on the common uh, in front of the state house at 8 p.m. Um, with the victims from El Paso. And I will just say that um, the El Paso massacre has mobilized the Mexican government in, in a very interesting way. The ways in which the Trump administration um, was attempting to bully and has bullied Mexico on, on migration issues, particularly, not, not just, but especially migration issues, has um, generated within the Mexican government the desire to put their own issues on the bilateral agenda. And so they've made a demand of the United States. They're, they're calling this an international terrorist incident. They want to prosecute the seller of the weapon. Um, they're, they're interested in taking action. And so that, that could change some of the dynamic between Mexico and the United States. Um, uh, and of course, this is um, it's understood in Mexico as part and parcel of not just white supremacy within the United States, but the, the overall um, uh, racist approach of the Trump administration to Mexico and Central America and, and the ugly ways in which um, that, ha that has mobilized um, white racism in the United States. So um, I think I'm going to leave it there. And uh, I have, I think I actually have a meeting um, uh, that's already started. <laughs> I'm sorry I went on for so long. Um, but uh, if, there's a, if there's any kind of question people want, like, I, I could take a couple minutes. Yeah, and any, um, any burning questions here for John? Okay, John. I, I think um, we're we're generally we um, as, as teachers, I think, are are very uh, hesitant maybe to uh, infringe on the extra time here uh, that you've given us. So so thank you. Um, we'll let you go for now, and thank you for sharing uh, your contact info as well. I'm sure we will have questions that pop up um, throughout the the debate season. We're going to be debating this from now through you know, the end of March or so. Um, uh -huh. And so I'm sure things will come up. Um, and I'm sure that uh, another piece of this is just that um, this is really kind of um, the first time we've really, uh, that we really dove into this topic. Um, so there's a lot of uh, kind of Googling and um, uh, knowledge building going on at the moment as well. So once the once we've gotten a little further along, there may be some more specific questions. Okay. Um, so I just want to mention also that I will be back there on September in Boston on September 3rd. And uh, some folks are organizing something in Cambridge. I'll speak in the evening of that, uh, of the third, which I think, I think is Labor Day. Dude, Labor Day or the day after Labor Day. But you're welcome to come and, you know, you know, have more conversation. I'll, I'll send the information to Roger and, um, uh, you know, I'm, you're also welcome to contact me if you have questions or things come up. Yeah, that'd be great if you could send me that, um, the information about that meeting. I'm sure we would have folks who um, would be interested. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Sorry I went on for so long. Usually uh, I prefer no, this, this is all fantastic more. stuff. And, um, you know, the, the, the big picture here obviously is that, um, we want to use these materials to uh, share with the students and help teach them about this topic. So just having such a, uh, a wonderful set of um, materials that you've given us and uh, suggestions on where to look and stuff is, is really the best that we can ask for. So uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Great. Thanks, John. All right, take care.